Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it. What is your message to Democrats who want you to be more confrontational with Israel and, and specifically to those that are saying that there should be an end to, to arms sales? I mean, do you recognize that there's been a shift and an evolution in your party, Mr. President, in the last 20 years on this issue? No. And I have a question for President Moon, but I can wait or I can pass it. There is no shift in my commitment the commitment to the security of Israel, period. No shift, not at all. But I tell you what there is a shift in. The shift is that we have to — we still need a two-state solution. It is the only answer, the only answer. And what I'm convinced of is that we can now move, as I had did even before I was able to negotiate — well, I shouldn't — before the ceasefire was negotiated that I made it clear that I spoke with President Abbas. We were — we're going to make sure that we are going to provide for security in the West Bank, and we, we renewed the security commitment, as well as economic commitment to the people on the West Bank. I also indicated to the Israelis that I thought it was very important that they stop in Jerusalem this intercommunal fighting that is by extremes on both sides. It has to end. It has to end. And I'm prepared to put together and I'm going to attempt to put together a major package with uh, other nations who share our view to rebuild the homes and without re-engaging, without providing Hamas the opportunity to rebuild our weapon systems, rebuild the, uh, the, the Gaza, uh, re 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 rebuild Gaza. And they need the help, and I'm committed to get that done. And so uh, I don't uh, — and I think that, you know, my party still supports Israel. Let's get something straight here. Until the region says unequivocally they acknowledge the right of Israel to exist as an independent Jewish state, there will be no peace. Can I ask a question to President Moon? I am. Um I'm curious if the two of you have offered any assurances uh, behind the scenes to Taiwan, and if President Biden uh, has, has pushed you uh, to take a, a, a tougher stance when it comes to, to China's posture towards Taiwan. Good luck. Well, fortunately, there wasn't such pressure. But um, as for peace and stability in uh, Taiwan Strait, we agreed uh, how important uh, that region is, uh, especially considering the special characteristics between uh, China and Taiwan. Uh, we des decided to work more closely on this matter going forward. You. So we have a question from a Korean journalist over here. Yes, uh, two from the left. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm Kang from Yonam News. Yonam News. Um, I have a question to both of the presidents here. Um, as was mentioned by the former uh, journalist, I understand uh, that the uh, Israel and Palestine uh, issues is very important, but North Korea's nuclear issues is equally important. On your to the list, uh, what's the number uh, that's given to the North Korean nuclear issue on your priority list, uh, Mr. B uh, President Biden? And also to Ms. Uh, President uh, Moon, in terms of your roadmap for resolving uh, the nuclear issue uh, in North Korea, um, I, want to, I want to understand whether you're time schedule actually matches and is equal to one another in terms of resolving the nuclear issues on the Korean Peninsula? So uh, to begin, uh, under the new Biden administration, the DPRK uh, policy uh, review has been completed in a rather fast period of time. That means that the Biden administration uh, puts a priority on its North Korea policy among its diplomatic uh, 
uh, tasks. And also in terms of uh, reviewing its uh, DPRK policy, there was a very close coordination as well as consultations uh, between the United States and the Republic of Korea. So the principle of the negotiations uh, towards North Korea has already been announced by the U.S. government. A very calibrated, practical, gradual, step-by-step -step manner, and very flexible. That is the approach that the current administration is aiming to uh, adopt. So that is the common understanding that we have with the United States and that we're going to continue to uh, work forward on this. And in terms of the timeline for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, there aren't any differences in terms of how we think about this. No differences in terms of our opinions. I agree with what the President just said. Our goal is and remains complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We want to make uh, practical progress and increase uh, security in the United States for the United States and our allies. You know, we closely studied uh, what others have tried and uh, what worked and what hasn't worked. And, uh, you know, under, we're under no illusions how difficult this is, none whatsoever. And uh, the past four administrations have not achieved the objective. It's an incredibly difficult objective. As we move forward, we're going to stay in uh, very close coordination with our friends and our partners in the region, including President Moon. And uh, we fully recognize that this is about uh, our collective security in the Indo-Pacific region. And so, uh, but total denuclearization is our objective and remains so. Oh, I get to the next question, huh? I'd like to ask the press a question, if I may. Uh, Nancy Cordes, CBS. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I have one question about North Korea and one question about Israel. We've changed this one question thing, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> Two foreign policy questions. Uh, you have said in the past that you would not meet with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, without certain preconditions. Yes. What are those preconditions, and do you believe he would ever be able to meet them? Well, what I never do is I never make a judgment what a man or woman is going to do or not do based on what they said. Um, we'll see if he made any commitment, and I would meet with him, and if there was a commitment on which we met. And the commitment has to be that there's discussion about his nuclear arsenal. And if it's merely an, a means by which, how do we de-escalate what they're doing? Um, and so, if that was the case, I would not meet unless there was some outline made that my Secretary of State and others would have negotiated as to how we would proceed. But what I would not do is I would not do what had been done in the recent past. I would not give him all that he's looking for, his uh, national, international recognition as legitimate and, uh, and say and give them what allowed him to move in the direction of appearing to be more, uh, how can I say it, more serious about what he wasn't at all serious about. I'd have to know specifics. But the idea of never meeting with North Korea, I would make sure that uh, my team had met with his count my, their counterparts, and I knew exactly what we were meeting on. And then in the wake of all of your conversations this week, what is your relationship like now with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? Do you have certain expectations that he will bolster the rights of the Palestinian people in some way? And if so, did you convey that to him? in your conversations? One of the reasons why we're able to get the ceasefire in 11 days, they didn't do what other people have done. I don't talk about what I tell people in private. I don't talk about what we negotiate in private. What I can assure you, though, is that the last time, it took 56 days and then six months to get a ceasefire. I'm praying this ceasefire will hold. I take Bibi Netanyahu when he gives me his word, I take him at his word. He's never broken his word to me. And, uh, but what I've made clear is that it's essential. It's essential that the Palestinians in, on the West Bank be secured, that Abbas be recognized as the leader of the Palestinian people, which he is. Hamas is a terrorist organization. We've recognized that. 
But that doesn't mean we should not be in Gaza, rebuilding Gaza for all those innocent people who, in fact, have been hurt and, and had been collateral damage, including loss of homes and a whole range of other things, as well as insisting that Israeli citizens, whether they be Arab or Jew, are treated equally. Israeli citizens. And that's what was going on in, in, uh, um, in, in Jerusalem. And so that has to come to an end. And Bibi, no, the Prime Minister, knows my views. And, uh, but the commitment that was given had, was immediately kept. I, from the very beginning, I told him what our objective was, that there needed to be a ceasefire. And he, in fact, kept his commitment in the time frame in which he said he would do it. Thank you. And by the way, I wasn't the only one that spoke to him. We had, I looked down here, every major player on my team, from Secretary of Defense to Secretary of State, all the way down the line, and our national security advisors were in constant contact with their counterparts in Israel, in Egypt, and throughout the Middle East. This was not something that was just done with a casual conversation between myself and Bibi. I have uh, presumptions to me to say this, but Mr. President, but I think I've got a great team. And, the res and I spent a lot of time with El Sisi on the phone in, 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 in Egypt, and they've done a commendable job of bringing Hamas to the table and getting them to agree to a ceasefire as well. Thank you. Is that it? Yes. A lady. All ladies do not raise their hands. Uh, do we not have female journalists from Korea? Good afternoon from Korea Herald. My name is Lee ji -yoon. The Korean people are very curious about vaccines, and they're waiting for the good news regarding vaccine. I understand that you've had a lot of discussions with President Biden regarding vaccine, and I wonder whether you have any good news to deliver to the people of Korea, and uh, has there been any meaningful achievement that you want to go into the details of? Yes. Regarding vaccine cooperation, you can read the joint statement and also the remarks uh, that were issued as press release today. Uh, but to emphasize it once again between the U.S. and Korea, for vaccine cooperation, there will be a comprehensive partnership to be established between our two nations, and there has been an agreement between our two sides on that. The U.S. has the ability to develop vaccines, and Korean companies have the capacity to produce a biomedicine. And we are going to combine those capabilities so that we can boost vaccine supply, so that we can accelerate the rollout of vaccines to the entire world, especially in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, for supplying vaccines to that region, I believe that we'll be able to make a contribution in that regard. And in that process, Korea, in my opinion, will p get some help in uh, stabilizing our vaccine supply. And at the same time, uh, for the sake of the Rock US alliance, President Biden decided to uh, provide uh, vaccines uh, to the servicemen in Korea. Uh, as soon as the US is ready, I understand there will be an announcement uh, to be made by the US side. Just prematurely make that. Now, we're going to there are 550,000 Korean soldiers, sailors, airmen who work in close contact with American forces in Korea. We'll provide full vaccinations for all 550,000 of those Korean forces engaging with American forces on a regular basis, both for their sake as well as the sake of the American forces. In addition to that, We've talked about the ability to have vaccines produced with our 
wor working with, and this is in the offing, working with uh, one of the major vaccine producers in the United States, and to the, where the, Korea is incredibly sophisticated, and with the help of that particular that the, that particular company will be able to make significant numbers of vaccines for themselves. And lastly, it is my hope and expectation. I cannot commit to it because we don't know for certain. But we think that over the remainder of 2021, we're, we're going to be able to vaccinate every American. We have enough. We have enough vaccine to vaccinate every American. Period. Right now, and we're going to be able to do that by the midsummer. And we're going to continue to get more people to engage in seeking the vaccine. I don't believe, I never have believed, that there's a large percentage of Americans who will not take the vaccine. And we're doing very imaginative things, and states are, to get people to show up and have the vaccine. But we believe, we believe that between the second half of 2021 and going in through 2022, we could produce as many as another billion doses of vaccine. Because it's not just, and this is what I like about this president, he's not just talking about any more than I'm just talking about the United States or just Korea. He's talking about the Indo-Pacific. He's talking about the world. We, with advanced capabilities, have an obligation to do everything we can to provide for protection of the entire world. I know that is an awfully, awfully, awfully ambitious proposal. But I think the nations that have that capacity are going to be continuing to work toward getting that done. And so, thank you. If you're not asking me a mean one like you usually do. <laughs> it's something interesting, I think, that has not come up. Uh, President Obama says that there is footage and uh, records of objects in the skies, these unidentified aerial phenomenon, and he says we don't know exactly what they are. What do you think that it is? I would ask him again. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Come on, boss. Let's go. 